Thank you. I'm fighting a little bit of a cold. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank the club and the executive committee for uh, the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, this morning, I wanted to summarize our experience with esophageal uh, stenting for perforation and fistula. I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest. I'm not sponsored by any particular stent or any stent for that matter. This slide is to remind me to say a couple things. First of all, this is a single institution experience and all politics are local. I receive calls and emails from people who uh, lament that they can't put stents in because the radiologists or the gastroenterologists control that. So I understand that. Um, I'll just give you our experience and hopefully that will give you something to look at and decide if this is something worth pursuing. The other thing I'll remind you of is um, we're asked about the numbers in these uh, three studies that I'll show you. And the reason is we live in a state of about six and a half million people and there are three general thoracic surgeons in that state. So while we may not do all the general thoracic surgery, we certainly get the more complicated things. Now before you think Indiana is a great place to move, we do have two endemic diseases. <laughs> One is histoplasmosis and the other I think you can figure out from this slide. And give the slow readers a chance here. Okay. Um, so esophageal stenting, not a new idea. Goes back to the, at least the 1800s. Um, advances in biomaterials led to tubes that could be put in at laparotomy, tubes that could be put in then through rigid esophagoscopy, and then the new generation of stents, which many of us are familiar with in the 90s, and quite frankly, many of us had bad experiences with, and I understand that. So try and keep an open mind for the newer stents. There we go. Also, non-operative therapy is not a new idea. Um, obviously, there has been uh, interest in treating certain uh, esophageal perforations in a non-operative way. Uh, the difficulty is that this set of criteria defines a very narrow group of patients, at least in my practice, and also is a paradigm shift. We're really changing the traditional goals of an esophageal perforation treatment when we look at these criteria. Everybody in this room is familiar with the operative treatment, the traditional operative treatment of an esophageal perforation. Most people would say that they rely on thoracotomy with primary repair, with or without muttress or, um, uh, muscle buttress, and gastrostomy and or jejunostomy. Now, the morbidity and mortality figures are really all over the map. There are some excellent series from the University of Michigan, from MGH, where there were no mortalities in their series of um, primary repair. But if you look at the majority of literature, Morbidity is somewhere between 18 and 60 percent, depending on how late the presentation or diagnosis is. Mortality, again, there are some series that had no mortalities, but a recent meta-analysis showed a, a, an average of about 20 percent. The more unusual procedures, which are sometimes required, diversion or esophagectomy, also very large operations. They commit the patient to need um, foregut reconstruction at some point. Again, not an easy procedure. A recent series showed that 50% of those patients never got reconstructed. Now, obviously, there are people with malignancies for the most part. Morbidity was very high, and the mortality was very high in that series. So traditional treatment is effective in most people, but it's, it's not a, a short slide, if you will. We're lucky to live in an era when at least minimally invasive techniques are considered uh, for appropriate reasons. And I think Dr. Mack, as usual, was ahead of his time talking about therapeutic and diagnostic modalities through natural orifices. We're seeing this with the gastroenterologists, the colorectal surgeons, and I think this is at least worth considering for esophageal perforation, as we'll talk about. So biomaterials have finally caught up with, I think, what a lot of us would like to see. And we have a whole new generation of stents. Now some of these are stents that were available in the 90s and have been reworked. Some of them are completely new stents. Uh, most of us are familiar with Ultraflex, Alveolus, the Z-stent, the Polyflex, which we'll talk more about, 
and then the wall flex, which just became available this past fall. Let me show you briefly the first case that, that piqued our interest in this uh, treatment modality. A 14-year-old male who at another hospital underwent, underwent a, quote, uneventful lapnison, had a post-operative leak, which was diagnosed late, was uh, septic, underwent two attempts at a primary repair at that other hospital, was transferred with, to us in ARDS with multi-system organ failure, bacteremia, a continued fistula, and what we thought might be an intra-abdominal compartment syndrome. We did not go to the operating room with the idea of putting a stent in this young man. We went to the operating room with the idea of doing a traditional repair. And after about two and a half hours, when we could not get to the GE junction through his abdomen because of what looked like irradiated small bowel because of his sepsis, uh, we were faced either with the idea of doing a partial esophagectomy with subsequent reconstruction or placing a stent. We did place a stent. We drained his pleural space on the left and constructed a silo for what we thought was an abdominal compartment syndrome. He fairly rapidly improved, uh, was extubated. A follow-up esophagram showed that the fistula was controlled with the stent. We took the stent out 20 days later, and he went to a rehabilitative environment and has required no subsequent surgery. So that really piqued our interest, not only in patients who were difficult operative uh, repairs either for chronic fistulas or continued leaks, but potentially, as you'll see, for initial perforations. And our thought was that the ideal treatment was something that was less invasive than the traditional treatment, but importantly, still fulfilled the traditional goals. Closure of the perforation, drainage of infected spaces, nutrition preferably enterally, and trying to maintain foregut continuity. Now, I realize that this is usually where someone raises their hand and points out to me that this may not be the right path, and I understand that. I just ask you to keep an open mind for a second. <laughs> if at the end you want to buy a vowel, I understand, but try and keep an open mind for a couple more minutes. So, what exactly do we do? And this is the question I'm, I'm most often asked. We confirm and localize the perforation with an esophagram, obviously, and also a CT scan of the chest and the abdomen before we go to the operating room. If we're interested in the neck, we also include that. We want to know as closely as possible where the perforation is and any associated things that we're going to need to do in the operating room at the same time. We do this in the operating room under general anesthesia. Number one, because in our practice it eliminates the need to argue with the gastroenterologists about who's going to do what because we're in the operating room and we control that. If there are any associated procedures, we like to do them at the same time. We would use, use fluoroscopy. The endoscopy, the stent, and any associated procedures are performed by us, no one else. Using the esophagram as a guide, we identify the perforation, which is usually easier than you would think. And this is flexible esophagoscopy. You can see the wire here that we've placed down into the stomach. We assess whether we think we can treat this patient with a stent or not. And we've had several patients that we didn't try to use a stent. One gentleman who had his esophagus filleted from the thoracic inlet to the GE junction with a TEE probe, for instance. That's not stentable. We like to place a peg if we're going to place a stent, and we do that before we place the stent for obvious reasons. That gives us a way to drain the stomach without a nasogastric tube and also to feed the patient. This, the three series that I'm going to describe to you all use the polyflex stent. And I know that there's controversy about whether that's a good stent, um, whether it's better than other stents. I, I don't receive any funding from any of the stent companies, including Polyflex. I will say in our practice, this has been what 